Hi, I'm Dr. Roland Roberts, and welcome to this edition of the Boardroom Series. My guest today is Brennan Purcell. Uh, Brennan was first trained as a historian at Stanford University and uh, then received his PhD from Harvard in 2000. Uh, he's a professor at DeSales University and also founded uh, there and, and is the current director of their Applied AI uh, program. And, uh, and so we're going to be talking today about the role that artificial intelligence plays in business, in your small business, your big business, uh, not the kind of the, uh, the, the boogeyman or the scary parts of, of AI, but practical daily things that you're able to use and how it can benefit your business and make it more profitable. Um, and one of the things that I enjoy most is uh, he's got a book coming out uh, called Outsmarting AI. And uh, Brennan, I want to launch with that uh, because I think that's a huge uh, myth, but also the elephant in the AI room, uh, which is people are concerned about AI. They are concerned that, uh, you know, Bill Gates has expressed his concerns. Elon Musk has, have, has expressed his. They're concerned about, like, like I say, the boogeyman. They're concerned that behind the curtain, that AI is going to think is going to be smarter because it, it can take 20,000 years of human learning and do it in a couple days because it can beat us at, you know, AlphaGo or whatever. Uh, so it, th because it can beat us in certain things, there's a fear that it can um, it, it can defeat humanity, decide we are the problem, and no longer useful to its consciousness and thought in the future. So uh, yeah, it's, so I want Sorry, to kind of start resist. right there and just say, you know, there is that element of it. So uh, in your even just the mere title of your book uh, is an antithesis to that entire premise, uh, outsmarting AI. So let's start there. How how in the world it, uh, you know? Do you outsmart something that, by nature, uh, can compute more than a human brain ever could? Because you used exactly the right verb. Uh, computers can compute so much faster than we can, it isn't even funny. And AI can do computations on data, digitized data, faster than any human being ever can. As you said, 20,000 years and in a matter of you know hours. So, but that's not the point. AI isn't smart. It's dumb. Computers are dumb. AI has not changed computer architecture, software design, the reality of ones and zeros. It is not human intelligence. Okay, it runs on things called neural networks, but that's just a metaphor. It's as dumb as it ever was. Now, for all of your clients, all of your connections, your network, your all of you listening, you might have heard of AGI, artificial general intelligence, uh, Elon Musk's statements are all over the internet. Look, if the main premise of that debate, when is a fully engineered human intelligence coming? If the main concern with that debate is how many decades will it take? It needn't bother you. And because your concerns are this quarter and next quarter. So anything that predicts, you know, pushing, pushing things out decades, I really wouldn't go there very much. Mm. And then, you know, people on the inside of AI, people who developed the algorithms and the machine language to get the algorithms to work on different parts of the computer, people like Dr. Andrew Eng, they're the ones who quietly tell you AGI, artificial general intelligence, that's not coming for centuries. Jeffrey Hinton, who developed the, the very famous back propagation algorithm, uh, he said, oh, what? They want to take what I did and, and engineer human intelligence? They should throw everything away and start over. So mm. don't even listen to that stuff. It's science fiction. It's hysteria. Um, well, and, and I, I want to add one yes. dot to, into that as well. I mean, if you look at, take eyesight, uh, we can't replicate the human eye. Our, think about our cameras uh, and photography. How many times the most advanced uh, equipment, photogenic equipment we have on planet Earth, and yep. take a picture of a sunset, and you'll still say that doesn't capture that. Um, it can't. And so, it, it, and remember, in our AI, your output's only as good as the input, which what it's being fed, right? The, the yep. data it's receiving. So if I'm receiving limited data, which the pixelated camera, you know, whatever that that equipment is not able to experience the full range. It cannot smell what I'm smelling and see what I'm seeing all to synthesize that data that is not, you know, X's and O's and ones and zeros. I mean, it, it, I'll take you one further. 
It has no idea. It's looking at a, at a sunset. You know what a sunset is, and you have all the associations with it. It's just taking a bunch of ones and zeros, laying them out in vectors, putting it in a GPU, and coming up with an array of colors. Now, if you tag that image, and you tag, like, say, a few million others, then chances are, when you throw a sunset in there, it'll come up with a similar tagging so it can seem to know what a sunset what an image of a sunset is but no it doesn't understand sunset well and you taught it based on uh you know repetition which of course they they start saying we teach machines very similar to the way we teach people but there are some things that no. machines can't learn no. uh period machine learning we still can't teach a machine how to walk uh, you know because of it, it, it a mach in, in robotics is not learning how to walk like a human, no. uh, even though it can observe billions of gates. And, and yes. but but it, the di one of the differences is it doesn't have the ability to fail. Uh, there's something about falling down and scraping a knee uh, that there is a will and a volition that happens where you keep going and you keep doing it until you figure it out. That's why we're not crawling around as adults. Uh, you, and, and to get a machine to do that is, is it, obviously really a waste of time to even try, uh, which I think, you know, it kind of leads us into some of the myths of AI, uh, because I really want to get into the practical, what can businesses do? Yes. But, but real quick, we need to dispel some of the myths around it or else sure. everything that you talk about, th they're going to still be replaying some of these. So mm -hmm. you talk about a few of them in outsmarting AI. What are some of the main ones that you see? Uh, the main one that comes up again and again, AI is not a robot. A lot of people think that AI is a robot. It's not. Uh, AI will control your mind. No, uh, Elon Musk, through his company Neuralink, is getting volunteers to have holes drilled in their head, to have yes. these really small like electrodes put in there. And he says, oh, pretty soon we won't need any schools. We'll just upload information to humans' brains. This is crazy because human neurons are nothing like transistors. Other myths. Um, it's well, going to run your let me, business. Let me it's uh, easy talk about money. that one yes, right sir. there. So, Go so on that particular idea, and I know that you know they're talking about just like a computer hard drive, you know, that is applications are stored and data stored. Uh, and then he's wanting to graft, you know, work on ways to graft this hardware, just like we, we <laughs> mix hardware and software. They're viewing the brain as software and let's literally but it's mesh. Not, it's not, that's just that. That's just your point is that hardware and software are completely differentiated in a computer in a brain. We can't. There's no processing area. There's no storage area. It all happens organically, wondrously, marvelously in the brain, and we can't sort that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so uh, other myths of AI that you experience and work with? Uh, AI is easy money. It's not. AI drives businesses. It doesn't. You do. Uh, AI is inescapable. If you don't adopt it, you'll fall behind. There's some FOMO, fear of missing out in there. There's other myths with that. But uh, no, what's more important, especially for your viewers, is what can you do about it now? Because what I've been hearing, there's a number of boards and a number of, uh, especially talking to CEOs, say it is time for you to get some AI in here and getting to work on it. Another myth, AI is not out of the box, off the shelf software. Each and every AI system is only as good as the data it's built on. So that we really need to shape the conversation around your data mm. and the business issues that you want to solve. So around the data and the business issues. So it's not a matter of a CEO or business owner just saying, you know, how, how does how does artificial intelligence apply to our business? I mean, it's not something you go purchase. Let's let's start using AI right. at XYZ Company. Um, so, so what are, the, me, what, are, yeah, give, give a couple of examples. Cause I know that really artificial intelligence okay. is being used in industries. I never would have yes. thought it could, uh, benefit those. Yes. So, so now, let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. So businesses large and small can roll in get in some AI powered tools. Like those of you who are using Salesforce CRM, you can use their Einstein AI powered product that will use its algorithms to give you better recommendations about which leads that you reach out to. There's a number of vendors selling AI powered solutions, but in terms, so, so in that sense, yes, you can get some of your service services enhanced with AI, then 
there's chatbots galore that you can roll out. Mm. It, the, the conversation shouldn't be about getting AI into the business, but looking at your workflow, looking at your design of tasks, looking at the way you do work, and then identifying those highly repetitive actions that you could automate using AI functions that would then free up your people to work on real value add problems. Perhaps we should back up. I would really like to convey what I think are the five functions of AI, what it really can do. Would you mind that? Is this a good time to do it? Okay. There's five things that AI can really do. Number one, image recognition or object identification in images, digitized images and video. It can do that if adequately trained. It it doesn't learn the way a human does, and it needs millions, maybe, of images. So yeah. So so, so, so so pause. So so yeah, when, yeah. when Facebook, when you upload pictures to Facebook, and it says, uh, "I think you're tagged in this," or "I think your photo is over here." Do you want to tag yourself? Is that AI? Is that a, a business application use that Facebook is using artificial intelligence? Facebook absolutely is using AI. They get their users to identify themselves and identify others. And in that example, they're getting you to verify that. And they're using facial recognition, which is just like object recognition. Facebook, smart as they are, they use AI all the time, but they don't offer any AI services right. to their users. No, no, no. They, they just sell advertising. Right. And they're good. They're, they're really good at what they do. It's a giant cash machine. So uh, image recognition, number two. Number two is good old-fashioned predictive analytics. Anything to do with diagnostic analytics, predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics, that whole body of of, uh, machine learning algorithms, AI can do that. It's really good. Hmm. So, so, but is is forecasting and and predictive analysis, is that really, I mean, that's kind of just mathematics too. It's still just an advanced computation, right? So All, all of AI is just math. There you go. That's all it is. There, That's all it is. See, that so, changes the conversation. If all, if you start with the, the information, the knowledge that AI is simply math, uh, math. Do, that's done at amazing speeds. And if we get quantum computing, yeah. it when we get quantum computing, then it'll be done at that. So great, it's just faster and better. Uh, yeah. But if that's math, then the whole conversations of is AI can AI be conscious? Uh, you know, uh, what is consciousness in, in, in this? Is right. it really thinking or is it computing? Right. It, it can only compute. That's yeah. all it can do. So we, we had our AI myths, AI principles. Number one, you know, data is yes. the mother of AI. Let, let's go familial. You got a woman, mother. No data, no AI. It doesn't work. And math is the father of AI. You put the two together, you can get AI. And AI is like kids. They're all different. In fact, some people have compared AI systems, not just the algorithms, the systems to snowflakes, because they're all a little different. So yeah, it's just math. The human mind could do math, but math can't do the human mind. There's Mm -hmm. so much about you, about everyone that is rational or sensual or perceptive or rational and irrational and ai has no concept of that but we should bring it back to the five functions the thing it can the things it can do would you mind that yeah please okay so we had image recognition predictive analytics then something called nlp natural language processing and that's getting better and better on your phone have you noticed how all those words popping up when you're texting right the the, the, the uh, recommendations are getting better and better uh google um uh real-time language translation is getting better and better and that has it's not because ai understands language it doesn't but it converts words to numbers and then predicts the relationships of numbers uh, of those numbers those Equal. worded numbers yeah. to each other and it's getting better and better. Will it be as good as humans? No, uh, but it's getting better and better so we can use more chatbots and more such tools. So we got three. Right, and, and then you have to, more. What, one pause on that one, and then we'll go to, to yes. four. Yes, yes. Uh, because one of the, the, the challenges in that particular application of that point, of that use case, is uh, the number of languages on Earth and then the, all of the uh, dialects within those languages um, and... You know, I was just in Africa, and one of the cha- one of the challenges to uh, and barriers to growth is the numerous languages that they have over there. Um, uh, one country, Ni- uh, Nigeria, uh, for example, um, 
or, or Kenya, I think it is, has 78, you know, and then some of the others uh, have, have, have even more than that when you start looking at dialects. Um, and so if, if, and to me, this goes back several thousand years whenever people were dispersed, uh, when Tower Babel. languages were confused. Yeah. Because it, this is the dream communication. Yeah. Because if we're all, if we, if you can all communicate and work together, you can, you can build pyramids and accomplish things that we can't even replicate today. Uh, so, so a unifying language or languages, um, is important regionally without a doubt, uh, for progress. Now, as, as it relates to, uh, to this, the challenges is how they, the, the nuances, like even just to take English, uh, the, the, the variations of what the word could mean. Uh, oh. you know, I was just in, I, I can talk to American entrepreneurs and business people about helping their business explode and, you know, Hey, don't you just love <laughs> things, you know, but, but in, and over here, you know, we think that means extreme growth, right? I mean, we, your business is going to explode. If I said that, you know, uh, you know, a couple of days ago in, in, in Rwanda or Ethiopia, everybody would be taking, you know, ducking for cover. Um, it, it, and so AI, even it, it, no matter what, it cannot understand. Think about how often humans, one to one human conversation, they misunderstand each other all the time. So to think that a machine is not going to, to misunderstand that, I'm just saying it, 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 it is a work in progress and it won't. There, there are so many nuances that a machine can't learn all of them and know which one you mean in the moment. Exactly right. So, so number four, there are limits. Yeah. But that being said, it's getting better. Yes. Number four, uh, data transfer. It's getting better and better. And this is key for reporting and working through business documents. It's getting better and better at trawling through piles of documents and associating words with numbers and then compiling them in another file over here, report generation, that kind of thing. Uh, it can really bring a lot more efficiency to the back office. It's getting better and better. And the fifth and final one, content generation. Just based yeah. on enough examples, maybe you've seen those images of people that don't exist. It looks like a person. It's generated by AI. Well, you feed in several million pictures, and then you can get the variations of the various aspects of physiognomy, and then you'll get it. Uh, and it's music. not even a, a, a real person, never has been a real person. It's a computer generated, but you would yes. not know the difference. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you wouldn't know the difference. Yeah. There's computer generated, there's AI generated pop songs and classical music, AI generated jokes are bad. Oh, they're terrible. But uh, I've heard it claimed that 30% of all Bloomberg articles are generated by AI with a light touch from an editor. Uh, sports articles, weather reports, yes. highly formulaic kind of things. They're getting, they're getting better and better at doing well, objects. It, it, now, um, how, do you feel, yes? how do you feel about that, though? I mean, let's go to the morality and the ethics of this, because I, I have seen the studies where they put in a couple of uh, Keywords like let's say uh, uh, men's basketball, Lakers versus Celtics, uh, and and uh, you know game game tonight you know or whatever, and it generates a whole article around it and what we think this person what to look for you know so and so has got this injury and that injury and it's pulling from you know obviously all the data that's been previously previously yep uh, whatever is available to it uh, let's just say on the inter internet that it can scrape and. And so it's getting, uh, it knows all of the players' stats. It knows every injury. It knows um, enough to make some, some articles sound unbelievably accurate. And I've also seen this done uh, on politics um, and on candidates and, and current elected officials uh, at mm -hmm. the federal level. And mm -hmm. using those type AI technologies, um, they are... Uh, so, so is it, is that a good thing? Is that a good use case for it? Um, does it actually help? It, it obviously helps the newsroom, but, uh, on, on, in a day of where we have disinformation, information warfare, you know, be it disinformation, uh, you know, is that something, is there, are there ethical issues with a, with a manufactured article or let me ask it another way. Do man will manufacture articles ever be able to be good enough to resonate with a with, with with a human? Can it can it put heart into its uh, uh, articles? 
Vietnam. Okay, you, you had two really important questions. The first one having to do with the ethics of content generation. Mm -hmm. It's just what it's doing. Uh, deep fakes and uh, revenge porn, taking somebody's face, digitizing it on some uh, highly objectionable adult content. This is character assassination. This is foul, all the rest of it. It's bad stuff. Producing articles on AI is kind of neutral, using AI, but passing it off as your own work with a human name attached to it, that is not ethical. Now, can it resonate with a human? Well, what artwork, how much artwork is out there in the world produced by humans that speaks to nobody, that, that speaks to the vast, not to the vast majority, but to a small minority? Mm -hmm. You'll find some people, I've heard, I've read some people going to pieces over AI produced art. It looks like drippy watercolor, weird stuff. They're saying it, it moved them greater than, than whatever, you know, to that extent, the eye, the, the, uh, the, the, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder, mm -hmm. yeah. but I wouldn't get up hung up on it too much because the question is, is there some use for your network and, the, and those business leaders to have some automated content generation? I'm thinking in generally not. That's what I put that one further down. Because, yeah, AI is being used for this, but there are ethical issues. And good heavens, you need a human being to check the results because AI has no idea how tasteless it's being. It, it, well, and to that point, it's hard to generate emotion. It, it can mirror emotion. Emotion, it can use words that mirror emotion, but it truly isn't thinking. There is something slightly different when a human has a deep held belief or conviction about something, and whether it's like extreme right, extreme left, you know, it, it that comes out. Yes, um, it does. And so, even if you go beyond the published word and go to the spoken word, like you've you've made appearances on CNN, you know, numerous numerous networks and so forth. Um, and so you're, you're not going to end up with digital talking heads, uh, you know, necessarily because of the fake, it, it would, it would, because of the, uh, almost, uh, because of the lack of emotional, uh, attributes that it could have. I think it would yeah. imitate it but just like with communication. It wouldn't be authentic. I'll, I'll give it to you, Roland. It's creepy, but if you find an audience, that's an audience in a niche that could use the product. Did you know that there's this thing called the Church of AI? It's You want to see a tax shelter that makes your skin crawl? Check it out. Find it online. It, it, someone may go to pieces over it. it. There's a lot of fad in this. There's a lot of... Um, of uh, almost, you know, like pseudo religion in some of this stuff. I don't even want to go there. What's at issue is what can it do now for businesses now, yeah. given their needs, the tasks, and the data. Uh, yeah. So what what uh, what makes the algor the, the the AI algorithm mm -hmm. different from algorithms we've been using for the last twenty years? And obviously, okay. they, they've been advanced, but there has to be a difference because if it's doing something very similar to what you know, software or computers currently do there. The difference is in the algorithms, I, I suppose. So what, 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 how do they differ? Uh, yeah. So what has changed recently? If these algorithms have been around for decades and computer architect, architect, architecture, excuse me, hasn't changed since the fifties, it's all come together. The back propagation algorithms that were developed in the 1980s and what these do, these allow the performance of AI algorithms to self-optimize. And I'll come back to this, but I just want to yeah, leave you yeah, with self I want, I want you to expound on that for sure. Okay, yeah. Uh, they were developed back then, but back then, computational power mm -hmm. was very expensive and it was slow. What you've just been getting in the last 10 years is the, the perfect storm, the perfect conditions where the cost and of the hardware has been plummeting. Uh, the amount of power and time it takes to perform the communications, the, the, the computations has been plummeting and the availability of data has exploded. You put all this together, it makes Moore's law look like, you know, manually building the pyramids and you're getting the general digitization of almost everything in life. And this is why, you know, when you opened with your present, uh, with your introduction of me, uh, people hear, what, he's an historian and he's in this? All of data is historical evidence. All of it, it's just very immediate. There's no such thing as future data. Mm -hmm. So AI is, is really taking over. It's really kind of 
taking within it a lot of other tools and improving them for those data analytics. That's what's going on. So, so AI does not create it in the truest sense of creation. Uh, yeah, right. Not the way a human does. Right. Uh, it, it, it requires data to create an output. And it, yes. it's not going to, it can't create in just out of nothing. It does not right. have ideas. It, it's not no. create, coming up with creative ideas. So, so if AI can't think, uh, and, I, and some people, once again, that's why we had to dispel some myths because, you know, they're saying it not only thinks, it then can, uh, certainly AGI or superhuman, superhuman intelligence, they want it to think and write its own code to improve on itself, you know, in terms of, in terms of learning. But, but uh, uh, you say that it can't think. So what, or C or, or those kind of things. So what, not the way human does. Right. Okay. So, uh, so, so how, how then would you advise the business owner, the executives that, that, you know, watch the boardroom series? What, how would you advise them then, uh, to, to implement this? Okay. Look where, obviously where your good old fashioned pain points and where can you gain in productivity given the five functions that AI can really do. Just to put all five together, that's how you get self-driving cars. With predictive analytics, the self-driving car always has to ask itself, where am I, given the data? So given the video analysis of the images in front and the LIDAR, the laser right, uh, sensor readings, where am I and what is the likelihood that I'm going to get into an accident with this thing in front of me or on the side. And then, so it's always asking that question and uh, the AI makes a decision. It's usually for a zero to one. Zero, you're fine. One, take evasive action. So you put all that together, the image analysis, maybe you're inside the car and you're talking to it, natural language processing. Data transfer, not so much. Content generation, don't go there. The point is, what about, what is your industry. And this is why the biggest chapter in my book is the one that goes through seven or eight different sectors of the economy and seeing how AI applications are improving productivity, improving efficiency, improving effectiveness. It's really, there's no part of the economy in which AI isn't working. Uh, agriculture, Mm -hmm. military, social services, uh, of course, marketing and advertising, it's made its most money, manufacturing, logistics, supply chain management, medicine, oh God. And then if if only government would get on board, with <laughs> yeah. this, you know, government, social services, legal. Well, are kind they're of starting to spend a lot. I mean, governments, uh, you know, starting about two years ago, really started putting in, uh, yes. uh, you know, eight, nine, 10 figures, you know, annually to, Billions. you know, on the artificial intelligence. But that's why it's important to know what are you investing in. If not, it's this big dark hole and it's really just, you know, tech uh, it, it, with a new term. Um, if it's just advanced computational things, if there wasn't a, a stark difference between algorithms and ways of thinking and how this works. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the things that, that I was surprised whenever I'm thinking farming, I'm thinking the way the combine cha cha changed farming, you know, or the, the mm -hmm. machinery changed mining. But one of the things I found interesting um, in Outsmarting AI was how a small farmer uh, yes. with, I think, the color of tomatoes. So share, share that for just a moment. All right. So this went viral. There's this young guy in Japan, and uh, he has an engineering degree, and his dad and mom are cucumber farmers. And so just getting on Google Cloud, he set up probably for free or for dirt cheap using their TensorFlow platform platform, a very simple AI classification model where the cucumbers come down one at a time on this conveyor belt. And in Japan, apparently there's 16 different classes of cucumber based on their shape, their sizes. And then he just set up a so little photo on a tripod, takes a picture, goes through the this, computer. Slow, slow down. Class. So, slow, slow down. Say, say this again. So what he did, yeah. set up a regular a camera on a tripod. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it takes a picture of each cucumber that comes under it. It then gets classified based on the trained data. He trained the algorithm to 
come up with one of 16 classifications, what kind of cucumber, then it proceeds down, and then a number of mechanical arms shoves it in this bin or in that bin. It's that kind so of thing. So they used to stand this at the end of the line. Viral. They used to stand at the end of the line, you know, having to look at each one. And this goes in this bin. This one goes in this bin. This one goes in that bin. And so now with this camera and a tripod and, and this, it, it is it, and putting in the data of, hey, this is the color and, the you know, this is this kind, this is this uh, goes in this bin. Uh, and then it's able to automatically sort that. And that is a real time application of yes. artificial intelligence in yes. that small business. Think of how many people spend their days, eight or nine hours, just standing there sorting through candy bars or whatever is coming off of the assembly line, it could be that their work, their their labor would be greatly enhanced by an image classification thing. Let me give you something else. Okay. Um, on top of that, uh, there, there's uh, different AI algorithms and combinations of them that can um, see what people are doing with the combination of data. Like say you have some people, it's their job to take items with the order and put them into boxes. You put a video camera above them and it reads it reads the QR code, whichever label code you have on it, and then make, it verifies that that's the order and that it goes. It's like an error catcher. Mm. And I, I'm telling you the cost of setting up one of these systems is coming down. Look, I however the, I had verification yes. departments back in 2000. Yeah, I take that back. 1997, I think, was the early yeah. that I ha was associated with verification departments for whatever the business was. You all yeah. had these the these checks and balances, which now yes. this can do, which still had room for human error. Uh, yes, and and we we experienced it from time to time. So no, I think. Yeah. It's a great app use case. Controls, quality controls. That's just 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 one example. Bring it back to agriculture, mm -hmm. right? We're all thinking of the combines, but the normal way to, to treat a field for disease is you fly over and you spray everything. Right. You can have drones go over and collect images of your entire crop, and then based on analysis of those images, find the places where either the watering is excessive or not enough, or where a disease first shows up. So that you don't have to blanket the field with pesticides or herbicides. You can just bl blanket or just treat one little area. Uh, you know, uh, it's this. there's a chance for real... I think I think what's at, what's at work is this. And this is why people have said, as the new electricity, um, we're going to finally see a boost in productivity above all in, in the white collar services, in the services industry. There's been huge productivity gains over the last 80 years, above all in manufacturing, yeah, yeah. corresponding loss of jobs, yes, yeah. more into services. I think AI is going to have a similar effect. It'll take time mm -hmm. in, in uh, the services area. There'll be some services that'll never work for AI, like uh, hair cutting. Yeah, right. Yeah. No. Yeah, no. I, I remember. But, I don't know. I might have been seven or eight, and I got the the, 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 the where one of those where it it was supposed to be. It was like a little suction cup or something, and hooked up. Loby. It was that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Loby yeah. I, I'm pretty sure they experimented on me uh, at one point in there. And there's like, okay, I'm pretty sure my mom said, no, we're going back to the barber. In fact, I'm pretty sure the barber had to fix it. So, yeah. Loby didn't live long. No, <laughs> not good. So, so I'm going to ask you the CEO question. All right. Go for it. So you can sell me all day long on the advance that my HR department can have, my security departments can have, the healthcare, customer service, marketing, sales, insurance, education, agriculture. Okay. The question though is, what's my ROI? How, does does where does the financial? I mean, I'm still I, at the end of the day going to take this back to if you're going to charge me you know, a gazillion dollars to uh -huh. implement this. So, so then where, then how does it happen? How do you even start as a CEO where do, to, to implement this? That's exactly what my chapter four is about. Lead like an accountant and a servant leader. You got to look at ROI from the very beginning and start with your data. What proprietary data do you have mounds of and what can that data 
do for you, either to reduce your error rate, to increase your efficiency, to lower some of your labor costs, or you know, using that whole group of services for KYC, for knowing your customers, to enhance your sales, to build that community, to really be in touch with your people so that what the services you're providing really speak to them in real time. There's, I can't give you... Um, a blanket answer because the, the economy is just too broad, but but start with ROI. And if, and if you're a CEO and you can't come up with a use for that data and that project, and say your data is siloed, that you have this data over here in manufacturing and this data is over here and your systems are all broken up and you have no unified system, you're not hybrid, you're not in the cloud, it, the whole thing may not be worth your while. So start with that from the very beginning. But where you can... Uh, Think about some vendors, thinking about augmenting your people's work. Whenever a CEO said, has said, let me do something big, like what GE Digital did, dude, they spent $6 billion and hired 3,000 software data scientists, coders, and came up with nothing. They were trying to come up with all of GE's data and unify it into the super intelligent nothing. Total waste. MD Anderson blew through 62 million trying to take on cancer with AI. What the heck is that supposed to mean? They mm. didn't treat a single person. And very quietly, that project was shut down. Don't think big. Think like an accountant. Think like a servant leader. Maybe it's not for you, but it's real and it's here and it's available. And, it, and, and, it is and maybe it is, you know, people have to think because it's so easy because it's it seems a little bit nebulous. We've put some teeth to it today some personality yes. to it, but it does still, I think it'll seem nebulous. It's easy to hear and say, yeah, but my business, you know, this is the data. And, it, but, but I want to connect one dot here yep. in that it's not just the data they have, it's the data that they could have. Your ex illustration about the uh, the drone in, in a field is, is case in point. Um, the farmer did not have that data prior of this immediate overarching state of his his fields and then maybe a notification if you know system a flagging system whatever um so that there was all kinds of data that he could have been capturing for a long time that then is fed into the ai system uh so they have to think a broader in the sense of what data could i have or would be good to know uh because there may be an ai way to capture data that yes. they have not been able to to date. Yes, that's absolutely true. So the reason why I wrote the book is to equip to equip people in business working in organizations, and I don't care if it's for profit or nonprofit; it doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. To equip them to give to tell them how it works and what it does, so that they don't get spooked by data scientists using crazy terminology, mm -hmm. so they don't get fooled to thinking, oh, but my algorithm does this, my algorithm does that. You know what? The algorithm is maybe 10% of the whole deal. It's really about the quality of the data and then the change management and the preparation for implementation among your people. Uh, the first studies are coming back up to 40% of all AI projects fail, usually because there's insufficient data or it's poor quality or People have dug in at your organization, and they, they, they've found ways to go around it and, and uh, sabotage it, or your data, your situation in the implementation changed, and the algorithm can't handle it. So, right. so it's meant to equip you to, to relate to data scientists and to deal with marketers, and don't fall for any of some of the wild exaggerations that are out there. That's fantastic. Brandon, I really appreciate you sharing some of this, uh, and, and, and I will say that uh, you know, your book, Outsmarting AI, it is the most. Uh, it, it does not use the the theoretical physicist and and, and you know super mathematical language uh, and, and spatial no. and all that. I mean, you really explain it in a very uh, layman way, and um, and I and I think a very entrepreneur and business friendly way. Uh, so someone does not even have to be in IT. In fact, I think you pretty much wrote it for the non-IT professional. In, in of course. Respects. It truly is. And it's not written so that I understand AI as much as, even though you will, it's more written so that I know how 
it can help my business, how to adopt it in my business, regardless of what that is. And I appreciated that perspective because, you know, the vast majority of what's available in terms of content and training on artificial intelligence is the boogeyman. And it is the, uh, the, 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 the hype really, uh, around, uh, around AI and I do think there will be significant strides in artificial intelligence to, uh, yes. to earth yes. statements. And I do think that it w- it, c- it there will be use cases that almost yes. resemble AGI because it is so yes. advanced. It's hard for us to be like that. It's thinking right now. But ultimately, um, you know, that that is not the case. And so uh, which means we can we can we can it is something to be embraced. And I also yes. want to bring up one last point, and sure. that is I don't believe that AI is something that it, you know employees and people need to dread as a job replacement issue. Uh, and I know that was a big concern in the in the automation days, uh, of especially manufacturing automation and so forth. People thought you know now they're going to lose jobs, and you know, but 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 they didn't. They started doing different jobs, even if you didn't need this department it really just expanded the business to be able to do yes. additional things. So thoughts on that? And we've seen that for a good three, 400 years that with the advent of each technology, yes, there are some immediate job losses. Like when electric lighting came through New York City, the gas lighting boys mm-hmm. that went around lighting the gas and turning it off, they lost their jobs. But the numbers of jobs that were created by wiring up the city and maintaining the thing, and look what we're doing with electricity today. It just doesn't stop. There will be some displacement, but it tends to create more jobs. And we've already been seeing this in AI. So in that sense, it's nothing to really fear. It was McKinsey or someone who predicted that like 40% of states are going to be irrelevant in a number of years. Uh, I just wouldn't pay attention to that so much. However, the feeling is there. So this gets back to how to bring AI into your organization. Got to listen to your people. You got to educate your people. You got to recruit them and get your heroes, get your big supporters and reward them. You don't want people to dig in and say, oh, no, this is this is going after me because it's not. It's meant to augment what they do. And you're you're, you're absolutely right, Roland, that AI will see more human, especially in the well-defined tasks, but it will never love you back. No, you know, I I love that. That's beautiful. And and you know you also took it back to the heart of things, which is people, uh, people. getting your people on it's people, board, uh, and 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 working with them, listening to them. I mean, yes, this is this goes back to just leadership one hundred and one. Yes, and yes, and that is the approach that uh, we certainly encourage leaders, business leaders, to take in adopting AI. And I love that it can't love you back. It's so true. Okay. Brennan, thank you so much for joining us in the boardroom series. And uh, we appreciate great. it. And once again, your book, Outsmarting AI, thank you for the work that you do um, in this field, bringing practical relevance uh, to, to a broad field. Thank you.